Okay. Well, I'm gonna leave then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So simple. The well, the Tuesday, September 21st, 2021 meeting of the Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Uh, Ryan, could I please impose on you to take the roll call? Absolutely. Chairman Roberts. Here. I am here. Clerk Hammer. He's not here. Commissioner Hughes. Yes, right here. Commissioner Oikel. Commissioner Dean. Commissioner here. Oikel is, is here. So I just, um, just so you know, J, J and G is, is George. Okay. Commissioner Oikel, you're still around? You can hear us and everything? We'll assume so. Commissioner Hamiki. Here. Commissioner Edwards. Here. Commissioner Vieira, did he make it in? Not okay. yet. Not yet. I Not yet. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Commissioner Drake. Here. Liam Bruni. Here. Prokotovich. Nope. I thought I saw him. All right. All right. So what's that? Eight? Yeah. So Oikel is here. Vieira will be here. Yep. Do we give him the benefit of the doubt? Yeah. All right. So I'll um, I'll seat the two alternates, Dave Drake and Pete and Bruni, and we'll have two, four, six, eight, nine, and one, two, three, four. Five. 10 when VR gets in. Okay. All right. Well, if he, if he gets here, we'll figure out what to do about the alternates. Um, we have uh, four separate public hearings tonight. The way we will handle this is that uh, we'll open each public hearing. The applicant will make a presentation Commission may have questions for the applicant based on the presentation. There may be some back and forth and questions. Um, once that portion of the public hearing is open, we will open it up to members of the public uh, who wish to comment on the application after everybody in the public who wishes to participate uh, has um, asked their questions or made their comments. We will take it back to the applicant to uh, respond to or amplify on anything that came up during the public comment. If at that point, um, the commission feels it has enough information to act on the application, we would close the public hearing and um, deliberate and vote on the matter. If after the back and forth with the public um, and additional information from the applicant, the commission feels that there are uh, issues that remain to be addressed or we don't have enough information to make a decision. Um, we may continue the hearing to our next meeting, uh, at which point the additional information would be provided, the additional conversations would occur and so forth. Um, I think just for purposes of managing the public hearing. Um, if you are either an applicant or a member of the public who is not participating in the application um, that we're discussing, I would just ask you to mute yourselves uh, just so that we don't end up with extraneous dog barking and people eating ice cream and things like that. Um, you know, when, when it is turn, uh, your turn to uh, to present or to comment, um, you can unmute yourselves and, and we'll, we'll proceed at that point. Um, so first item, public hearing application 2091-21Z, Zaid Khan, 204 Silestine Highway, applying for a special permit in accordance with section 52B2 uh, for use of property for a driving school and tax office. Um, saw the applicant here early, earlier. Um, if you could please identify yourself by name and address for the record and um, 
let us know what it is that you plan to do. Hi, everybody. My name is Zahid Khan, and um, address is a 204 uh, Salestine Highway, Wethersfield, Connecticut. And um, I'm here to present my uh, uh, application that uh, I'm planning to open a driving school uh, in a plaza, in a ShopRite plaza. And also I would like to do a tax, offer a tax services at the same time. I own a driving school in Manchester and I also own a Liberty tax office in Manchester as well. So I'm not sure that, you know, this is my first meeting. So uh, we already have a lease signed up with the plaza. We already had an application process to the DMV. We're waiting for it and um, all we just waiting for your approval. And um, so the town can give us a approval and then, you know, those people, uh, people from the plaza and the construction people, they can just start uh, making some changes and uh, do some updates on the proper address, whatever I'm opening the store, which is a 204 Salestine Highway, Weathersfield, Connecticut. Okay, and that's where the barbershop used to be? That's exactly, yep. Okay. And in just for the record, in our file, we have a memo from Peter Gillespie dated September 16th, uh, indicating that the site's presently zoned general business, which permits educational institutions um, as well as automobile establishments. I don't know that this is an automobile establishment. No, um, it's not an automobile. It's uh, going to be a driving school. So, you know, we do have a uh, vehicle, you know, for the driving students, but it's not a service uh, with the automobile. Okay. Would would that car be there all the time, or would you take it home when you're not teaching people to drive? Yes, uh, usually we, uh, uh, you know, if it's a safe enough for me to leave the car over there, but since, you know, it's a, we are very close to the Hartford area, we will take it home. While we, the office is open, we'll leave the vehicles over there, but on the other times, we'll take the vehicles at home. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for the applicant? Hey, Rich, the this, commission? Yeah, this is Pete. Yeah. I'm just curious, how, how many cars are we talking about? One, two, ten? We're, we're talking about the two cars, the max. <clears throat> okay. And, uh, just explain to me, I was just curious, you're gonna run a, a dual operation. One is a school and the other is a tax office. How, how does that work? And how does the flow of business between the two work? Okay, the most uh, uh, probably, this is a driving school uh, institution all year round. But what is that thing that, you know, I, uh, since I own our office, uh, tax office, and my uh, corporate office, which is a Liberty Tax in Virginia, they would like me to open an office in a Wethersfield, uh, you know, another uh, tax office. So what I did, I just have that option on my hand in case the corporate office will approve. So then I would be able to do the tax office also for only three months, which is like three to four months uh, uh, from uh, January 1st to the April 15th. How many employees would you have for either the driving school or the tax office? One extra one for each. The driving school between a two and three and a one person for the tax office. Okay. Uh, Peter, I, th I think I read that as far as parking is concerned, there's no issue here, right? Because that parking lot has a lot of vacancies. So I, I don't think that this use is going to be uh, at all a problem, right? For that's, that's correct, N not an issue. Uh, as as the occupancy of the shopping center uh, changes, then we'll deal with those businesses as they come. There are, there are a couple of businesses that we've been talking to who have an interest in uh, being in there, but at this point, um, there's obviously plenty of parking given the vacancies there now. Okay. All right. Anyone else on the commission have questions for the applicant? I see George pretending to talk, but you're muted. 
you're still muted. Tap on your face, George. Anyone else while he's working on that? Uh, th this is Dave Drake. My personal opinion is it's, it's a perfect spot for what he wants to do. So I don't have any issues at all. Yeah, I agree. I don't have any questions because it's, it's yeah. a, good, a really good use for this corner. I, I appreciate no it. Thank you. I have no questions. Okay. <clears throat> um, Rich, George. Point, um, I just want to note that the hours apparently are from 10 in the morning till 7 p.m. And Saturday would be from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. But that seven o'clock hour, um, is there any issues with the lighting? Peter, is that side of the parking lot pretty well lit? And there is a lot of traffic flow going around that corner. Is that any concerns at all? No, that, that uh, given obviously what I said before about the vacancies, there's there's a whole side parking area uh, on, on, the, on the south side of the building uh, and the shopping center uh, has a full lighting system so um I, I don't and and they're you know so i don't i don't anticipate any any problems with that uh although i'll have to drive by at night sometime make sure all the lights are fully uh fully operational okay anyone else i don't know george you're muted if you're trying to Ask questions. The minutes won't be the same without George. <laughs> the minutes reflect. George said something. George tried to say something. I don't know how to resolve that. Yeah, and I can't un I can't yeah, unmute you can't, him from You can here, mute so. people, but you can't unmute people. Right. George, right. George, on your image, there's a uh, should be a blue box at the top where you can click on and unmute yourself. If that makes sense to you. Or in yeah. the lower left picture of a microphone that you can click on. Yeah, that works too. If you move your your cursor your mouse around your cursor around on the screen it'll activate it or you can come over here you can drive over to ryan's house uh, <laughs> you see okay. a little microphone not doing it there we go. Oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Everybody's clapping for you. You got this. Oh, now it's muted again. <laughs> <laughs> Try on celebrated too early. You're muted again. There you go, now, George. Now Don't touch anything. Mute. Don't, don't hit touch it. Don't, anything. Don't touch anything. Yeah. <laughs> Speak. Go now. Speak. Uh, okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Good to go, George. You. You want me to hit the mute? No, no, no. No. Oh, you know what? I now. think he's. No, I think he's lagging. I think that's what's going on. We can hear you now. Okay. I'm wondering if he's lagging. And yeah, he's, 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 listening. he's listening to us from like a minute ago. You're there? Yes. I'm hearing you fine. Mute down in the corner of the screen here. Yeah, and so it says mute. And I, it, uh, I, I'll hit that 
No, we can hear so you now, Joe. No, he's we're not talking to you, Charles. But you're good now. All right. <clears throat> Perhaps we should have him call in. Yeah, my my screen saying his uh, bandwidth is low. Yeah, so if he, maybe if he turns off video. He's, turns off with video, he'll have a higher bandwidth. Yeah, he's, voice. he's lagging. If he turns off his video feed, usually that helps. Or just call him. George, at the bottom, if you want to hit stop video, that might help so that we can hear you. Yep. Now unmute. Rich, can we uh, go to public comments right now and then ring up George, see if we can help him out and then come back to him or not? Well, he, he's unmuted right this second. So let's just, George. Yeah, I, I guess, um, is there anybody in the public that wishes to comment on this application? Don't hear anyone. And there's down at the bottom. Do we need him to approve this? Or we'll vote no, on I, what I'm, we're gonna do? No, I'm just trying to be respectful of <laughs> the fact that he's here and trying, but uh, I'm with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, at a certain point, I, I think we have to move on. All right. Is there Rich, anyone else who has? Rich, you just want to put this on pause and, and come back to it? I mean, we got a few others. Well, no, we're going to have we're going to have the same issue on everything. All right. Maybe and over. Frankly, the I mean, I, I may be wrong, but I think this one's uncontroversial enough that I think we can yeah. Yeah. Kind of move it along. Um, anyone else, any other members of the commission, anybody in the public have any questions, comments? If not, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. I'll second. Motion by Ryan, second by Peter. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, does someone want to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the application submitted uh, as is for um, the use of this property as a driving school and a tax office with the associated hours as designated in this application. I'll second that motion. All right, motion by Peter, second by Vieira. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. Okay, next one. Public hearing on application 2092-21Z. Joshua Tryon, 42 Crest Street, special permit in accordance with section 351B4 for the outside storage of a boat in a driveway. Um, is the applicant here? If so, could you please identify yourself by name and address for the record and tell yes, us what this, you... This is now. Joshua and Diana Tryon at 42 Crest Street, Weathersfield. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Josh, my wife, Diana. We moved to 42 Crest Street at the end of February this year and have since been welcomed to the neighborhood by many of our neighbors. Um, 
I've been a lifetime boater with my family and have owned a boat personally for 13 years. Two years ago, Diana and I upgraded from my old boat to buy our current one that's in the driveway because we could see, it, see owning it for a long time. We could see raising children on the water someday. Last year, I proposed to Diana on this same boat. So we already have many great memories on the boat that we want to continue for a long time. This request is that during the boating season of May to October, we'd like to keep the boat in the rear corner of our paved driveway. A huge consideration when we bought our home on Crest Street was the proximity to the Weathersfield Cove where we've always launched the boat the majority of the time we go out even prior to moving to the town. Unfortunately, there isn't enough room, we think, on the side of the house to properly store the boat and trailer there. And there's too great of a slope on that side of the yard. During the off season, we will be able to store the boat in our garage because we hired a contractor at the beginning of this whole process to modify the garage so that the boat would fit. But getting, in, getting it in there after all that work takes several hours to remove the rear platform and the trim tab so that the boat will fit. It also requires a few people to help us get it in there. So for the two of us to do that every time we go out um, weekly during the boating season, it would be next to impossible. With the boat parked in our driveway where we're <laughs> requesting, we still have plenty of room for our two vehicles. We still have another parking spot free with our two vehicles and the boat in the driveway. And the boat doesn't impede our use of the garage at all. You can see in the meeting packet, um, we have highlighted where we're currently keeping the boat and this is where the request uh, reflects. Uh, it, it will always be covered with the mooring cover. It'll always be well-maintained so as not to create an eyesore for our neighborhood and will always be part neatly and tucked into that corner of the driveway. Um, there have been a few comments from the three letters of disapproval that I'd like to speak to just for reference. The first is the comment um, that since we knew the boat couldn't fit in the side yard, we shouldn't have pur purchased the house. Um, I'm sure as everyone knows the housing market in late winter and spring houses, if they were priced well, they were gone in two days. Um, we did turn down even looking at a lot of a house, a lot of houses, if they had a small single car garage or a single lane driveway, because we knew that wouldn't work well with having a boat and two cars. So to that point, we did, when looking at the house, think that the boat would work here. Uh, when we found this house, we measured the garage. We knew we could make it work at least for winter storage. Um, with the house also having a wide driveway capable of fitting the boat and three cars, we never thought keeping the boat in our own driveway during the summer would have been an issue. Another reason for disapproval from two residents farther up the street are that the boat hasn't moved all summer. Uh, as I said earlier, we did get married on July 30th this year. And as you can imagine, we were completely tied up with all the planning and events around that, the honeymoon. Uh, we were gone most of the month of August for the honeymoon and a family vacation. So that is a big reason that the boat sat more than during a normal year. Uh, I'm sure we all know that there was a record amount of rainfall and the Connecticut River was rendered useless um, due to the debris, the high water levels and all that. So um, that's a big reason that the boat did sit more than normal. In regards to the statements about the boat being uncovered, it has only been uncovered during the day when I leave for work and I do cover it when I get back home. It's only been uncovered a few times this summer and that's after some of this crazy rainfall just to let it air out and dry out. So that's just part of us keeping the boat in good condition. Um, again, we, we don't want it to become an eyesore for the neighborhood. Um, it may be that there's a misunderstanding on what covered meant. Maybe those neighbors think that meant a carport or something like that, but I just wanted to speak to that because a couple of residents mentioned that. Um, one of the letters states that they are worried the boat will become a projectile, um, and I quote that during inclement weather. Um, the boat and the trailer do weigh 
6,100 pounds. So her car will probably uh, become a projectile long before the boat. So I just wanted to speak to that point. Um, we do also keep the boat parked with four wheel chocks on the tires. So um, for, for instance, with all the record with the uh, weather we've had lately, it hasn't moved an inch during all that. So I don't want any, anyone to worry about that. Um, for the neighbors that have spoken for us, 27 Crest Street, they wrote a letter and they said they can directly see the boat. And I did send over today a map that shows from the overhead which neighbors have sent their approval and they're circled. Um, so 27 Crest Street does have a direct view of our driveway and they are in approval of the boat. And they further stated that we keep our yard and home maintained, which in their words is an asset to the neighborhood. Uh, they, they go on to say that having the boat in the driveway does not detract from that. So um, I want that to be considered as well. Um, in addition to 27 Crest, the approvals uh, that we have signed that I sent over today include the neighbor directly across the street from us at 45 Crest who has a full view of the boat from his front window. Directly next door to us at the right is 36 Crest, which, the house, uh, which is the house with the closest location to the boat. Um, directly behind us sharing our rear property line at 53 Sunrise Terrace is in approval. Um, two houses to the left of us at 54 Crest, who has full view of the driveway, is in approval. 51 Crest, diagonally across the street from us, has a direct view of it and is in approval. And finally, 15 Crest, who is in, on the other side of the street a few houses down, but has a direct view of the driveway, are also in approval. Um, we, we do feel that the weight of those seven votes of approval from our most direct neighbors should be considered highly by the commission. It was important to us to make sure that our most directly affected neighbors approved of the boat in the driveway because as new neighbors, they've all made us feel so welcome here. So we, we want to continue that. Um, when I had a, a minute to look through the email chain that was included in your packets from Mr. Chase to Mr. Gillespie and Mr. Morrison that's in your packets, uh, I do see Mr. Chase is the neighbor who originally reported the vote to zoning, and he's taken issue with many things on Crest over the years, um, such as our neighbors cleaning their RV on a weekend that wasn't acceptable to Mr. Chase, or another neighbor using gravel that didn't match their asphalt. Uh, these are both included on page 25 of your packets. Um, while I do appreciate neighbors that look out for the well-being of others, Mr. Chase's opinions as a resident of Westwood, I don't think should be, should outweigh the opinions of those residents directly around us. Um, our immediate neighbors have said that they, the ones that can see the boat right out of their front windows, say they have no issue with the boat in the spot that we're currently keeping in and that we are requesting for the permit for. Um, in addition to the seven that have signed their approval, um, there are, the sign has been in our yard since September 10th, and there are 39 people that have not written to express disapproval. So in total, that's 39 out of the 42 residents that received the notification that don't have an issue with the boat in the driveway. We really want to thank the Planning and Zoning Commission and want you to know that we want to make the boat work in our driveway in a way that's respectful to our neighbors. Um, we pay taxes on the boat to the town, register the boat, the town parks and rec gets our yearly launch membership fees for the use of the cove and we're going to continue that for a long time. Um, thank you for your consideration and thank you for everyone on the call for, for listening to us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, does anyone on the commission have any questions for the applicant? Yeah, uh, which David Drake, I'm looking at the pictures. You, you can't fit that on the left side of your house? The left side of the house between our property line and our direct neighbors is only 12 feet wide and it's a slope 12 feet wide. Um, so it, the boat itself on the trailer is 10 feet and we have 
we have rock on the side there. We have a brick path, a brick walkway there. Um, so in addition to the slope and the barely amount of room wider than the boat, I feel like it would almost be sitting in our neighbor's yard if we park it there. Um, she is installing a fence there soon as well. So I, I feel like it would render the side of the yard useless if we parked it there versus uh, the, the plenty of space that we have in the driveway for it. Okay. Anyone else on the commission have questions? Uh, yeah, just a quick question on uh, when this boat will be in and out. I think if I remember correctly, you're going from May to October. Uh, it would be outside, correct? Yes, May to October. Um, we, we like to get a, we like to make our season as long as possible. So we're usually out there as soon as it's warm enough. Um, so just to make sure that we cover the season, it's most years it's from May to October, yes. Okay, so in November, uh, it looks big. I'm not sure how you're gonna fit that in the garage. We've already test fit it once and it just, it's a little too long with the platform and the trim tabs on, which is why we, we will be able to make it work for winter, um, but it's just, to do that every single time out, just the two of us would be too much. Okay. Yeah, just following up on uh, uh, Dave Drake's comment uh, on, the, on that side, did, did you consider at all uh, paving that side? I know it's tight. Uh, if you fixed the slope and paved it, would it work? It, it's a really tight fit um, with having to back it in there um, where, and we'd have to drive over the grass on that side of the yard. So maybe if we made it a three wide driveway, but I think that might be a little more unsightly than just having the boat in the, the current two wide driveway. Um, space wise to your point, you know, it's, it's 10 feet wide on the trailer. There's 12 feet technically there that you can see from the plot plan, but we'd probably have to modify our gutter down pipes that come about two feet out. Um, we'd have to put a considerable, considerable amount of money into leveling it and paving it. And then even then we'd still have to drive over the grass to park it there. So I, I feel like with how wet Crest Street and maybe um, there's maybe not residents on here who can attest to how wet our yards get here on Crest Street, but um, I feel like it would ruin that side yard having to constantly back the heavy boat and the truck over it to park it there. Okay, good, uh, good description. One last question, the coverage of the boat, is that that red drape that you have on there? What what does covering it's, mean? It's it. So um, it, I think the first picture shows that it's basically there's a separate cover that goes over the front bow area of the boat that's watertight, and then there's a separate one that comes from the front window and goes all the way to the back of the boat. Snap down. So and it's it, not like it, wrapped or anything. It's no, it's not. It's not wrapped. Um, gotcha. It's it's a snap cover. So understood. It's mm -hmm. good. Okay, yeah, I can see it now, yep. All right, understand, thank you. I have a question um, just regarding the, the stakes that you got, looks like you got, I don't know if you put those stakes in yourself or you did like an A2, are you anticipating like fencing or anything? That, that's for the neighbor's fence directly oh. next to us. Um, that's the neighbor that is expressed they're perfectly fine with the boat in the driveway and the one that we don't want to get too close to the fence to uh, and and have it between our two houses for, for it to be unsightly, unsightly for her. Um, those stakes she had put in um, in preparation for the fence that she's putting up. So, so I circled it. There's one picture. Well, one yeah. first picture you can clearly see it. Yep. The other one I circled just so you can see farther back where the property line is there between the houses. So driving up the road into the page on picture one fence is going to completely block basically the first story and the boat and the car. Yeah. Yep. Right. That's a good point. I didn't think of that. <laughs> but it'll be a short fence, right? Based on what we just recently approved. Wouldn't be very tall. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, it is for her dog, so I don't know the details of whether it's chain link. Well, it looks like we're going. Oh, oh, so it might be a yeah. It could just be like a collar one. Hey, hey, uh, this is David Drake. It's just a general ob observation. I understand all your neighbors are for what you find and everything, but if if we approve this thing, what do we do next week? If if like fifty people come in and want to put their bolts <laughs> in the driveways? Well, I'm I, serious. I, 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 I mean, do. That's, what my, that's my concern. You know. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I think it's still on a case by case basis. Someone has someone can't put a 40 foot yacht in their driveway next week without the approval from their neighbors, just like we're doing. And if someone were to do that or were to put something run down in their driveway, yada, yada, um, the neighbors still have the chance to say no, because it's, you know, a, a monstrosity. I think we have shown that, you know, we take very good care of it um and all that and and i think you know in this case it isn't an, an eyesore in our opinion i won't let it become an eyesore because this is my first home i'm so thrilled and i just want to be great neighbors and i mean sorry i'm finally speaking but <laughs> i think the way we maintain it the boat just looks we will never let it you know get run down or anything and i think that kind of separates different people who apply potentially is the quality of the situation. Mm. Oh, quick I question. No, go ahead. What year is the boat? It's a uh, 2007. Oh, seven. Okay. okay. And the, the trailer is a 2015. Uh, I, have, I have another question. Following up on uh, Commissioner Drake's uh, concern, which is my concern as well is the idea of precedence here. Has has this been done anywhere else, uh, Peter? I mean, is this special permit uh, for storage of slightly oversized boat here? I guess it's five feet or three feet bigger than what's allowed by the regulations and the front versus the back. Have we done this before anywhere else in Wethersfield? Uh, yes, um, you know, you've done this for boats, you've done this for some trailers and RVs. Um, um, I, I probably could have pulled together a list for you. I mean, it's not, um, it's not something you do all the time. I would say probably one a year, something like that. Um, maybe, maybe less sometimes, but uh, you do get these and you do have provisions in your regulations that allow you on a case by case basis to do this. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily be concerned about precedent. Uh, each case is unique and you, you guys have to determine uh, based on each individual request whether um, you know there's other options available. So um, so yeah these are these are all individual cases. And okay. if I if I can say if it helps the case of the permit, um, we can state in the permit or modify it to say it's only for the size of the boat we have now. Uh, if there's any provisions in there that would help to uh, get this approved, we're more than willing to work with the commission. It's good to hear that because that would have been another concern of mine. I mean, you know, you are a little bit bigger than what's allowed already. And I, I think it's, it's okay to, to, to state that uh, as well, you know, that your intention is not to go any bigger, basically. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely wouldn't be any bigger. <laughs> yeah, I think just to, to kind of clarify the, the point that Peter just made, it, it's not just the length, it's primarily the location. Um, you know, what's permitted is an 18 foot long boat or RV or trailer or whatever behind the front line of the of the house. So it's, you know, essentially the side yard or the, or the rear yard. This is both larger and in the front, um, you know, as opposed to what would be permitted as of right. And our practice in the past when we have approved these is to be very specific about what it is that, that we're approving just so that you know, tomorrow it's not a 34 foot boat um, yeah. that, that suddenly materializes in the same driveway. Yeah. Yeah, we're perfectly fine with any of that wording being written in to the permit. And we, we had done a, an application where we, we had it enclosed 
um and i th- you know had like a gate on a fence and all that kind of stuff and that's i i feel like you know that was that was one scenario where there was actually room for it um, was it on the side was it on the side yeah it was it was along the side and you know yeah. this this property doesn't necessarily allow that so you know it is case by case so when you get um you know the next boat that's going to come up and somebody says well you did this for this guy this for this person you know it's not necessarily because of it's just a boat in front of the house it's like you know what can we do about it um you know that's just sort of throwing that out there like where there are situations where you can do more and if we see that it's not necessarily like a cost prohibitive measure sure but you know in this case it looks like you know, you'd be not allowing anybody, especially if a fence ever gets put up there, if, it, if it's an actual physical fence in the future, you wouldn't be able to go around the house on that side for, you know, most of the year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyone else on the commission have any questions for the applicant? Hey, George is unmuted. I think I am. Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I get concerned <laughs> with our approving these at times. Approved a number of the most in the northern part of town. With serious issues. Uh, I hope our zoning enforcement. George, we George, we got to figure out how to turn your video off. Take care. Video isn't on. Turn your video off. Is what I, is what I'm asking you to do. Go down to the bottom. So the same place that you turn your the, uh, that you unmuted. I want you to stop video. Yeah, you'll sound better if you okay. do that. All right, now now let's hear you talk. That makes sense. Now good. No, turn turn it back off. No, turn it off. Turn turn your video off, and we will be able to go. hear you fine. Now now speak. Let's hear you. Does that do it? No. No. It says no. I think stop the video. Yeah, hit stop. Oh, that's video. why I was hitting it. I did. Yeah, leave it go. off. And now leave, leave it, it off. And we it off. be able to hear you. Okay. okay. You're the best. Now you're good. Now I you're just, can I continue with what I was saying? Of course. Yeah, we can me? hear you much better now. Oh, good. Good. Okay. Thank you. I, I was getting yeah. distortions on, on the overall video, too, tonight. Um, some. Anyway, uh, yeah, I uh, I get concerned that we approve too many of these, and not that we've gotten many in the last two or three years. Uh, we did get some prior to that, the last the four or five years prior to that. Uh, this helps Peter understand a little bit, um, Liam Rooney. Uh, but uh, it gets me concerned, everybody, if we approve these, are our regulations appropriate? Should we be looking at the size of boats that go in these areas? Improve it slightly or not? What do you think, Peter? Well, George, we uh, we did that some years ago. We studied all the surrounding towns, and I provided you guys with a with an overview of that. So I'd be happy to dust that off and. Uh, revisit that, but um... okay, I hear you. But maybe but, you uh, want to send that out. I don't know. Yeah, just just to uh, George, give me a second, just to follow up on what you said. Uh, as uh, Chairman uh, uh, Richard said, that this is an issue of location and size, right? So, yeah. to me. It, it really comes down to, are, are we going to allow boats in the front of properties, period? Uh, you know, obviously the size makes sense that we would control that. Uh, we wouldn't want anything obtrusive and it, it, would, it would be something that we'd have to review. 
But the whole issue of having, you know, a vehicle stored for a period of time in the front yard is really what we have to decide if we start to think about our regulations and are they appropriate. I'm I was case by case. Peter, all yeah. I was thinking of was, are we a foot or two off on the, what we allow or don't allow, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's okay. all I was getting at. Well, let me let me ask you, why is this case any different than anybody else, other than the fact he has a lot of nice neighbors? <laughs> no, I, no, I think I think you're right. I mean, it, it's a question that we basically confront every time this comes around. Um, and frankly, I think the issue comes around every couple of years when there's an interest in enforcing the regulations. I don't think we've ever had anyone come in and said, oh my God, I need to get a special permit for my boat. I mean, it, it's, you know, invariably as a result of either complaints or enforcement. So, um, you know. The, or people know the, the rules and they buy a boat that's appropriate for the spot. I, I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, next year, next yeah. year could be a 30 foot boat <laughs> in the same spot. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and we'll be we'll be having. Where do you draw the line? Yeah. Well, I mean, and and you know, unfortunately, that's what the whole case by case basis, you know, depending on the topography, the the alternatives, the shape of the neighborhood, the you know configuration of how the houses are laid out together, how the street flows. You know, all that sort of thing factors into it. I mean, we had that one on Jordan Lane where it was a corner lot, you know, and, and even though it was a corner lot, the guy was able to put up the fence that essentially blocks it, um, you know, so that that was how that one was handled. But, uh, you know, I, I think we probably shouldn't belabor the, you know, the underlying philosophical issue tonight, um, you know, while we have other things on the agenda, but it, you know, absolutely understand that this is something that we've struggled with pretty much every time it comes around. I, think um, we're, I agree with you, Rich. Uh oh. Yeah, but it's a case by case basis. Each, you know, and maybe they have neighbors that are really against it, and it would be a different uh, feeling here. You know, when you have everybody who it's in a butts and whatnot, we can take the temperature of the neighbors and see how it goes. So setting aside the underlying philosophical issue, the, uh, Chairman, that, that you pointed out, and I, and I think we'll have to deal with that at some point. If we look at this particular case, uh, in my opinion, uh, I think these applicants have done a pretty good job of describing uh, mm -hmm a well-controlled situation, especially if, you know, we had that this is, this is the maximum limit of boat period. You know, it's gonna be this or smaller if you, if you buy another boat, uh, that'll be allowed. Uh, they do have a problem with this property. I mean, it, it's a constraint. Uh, and most of the neighbors, the majority of the neighbors really had no issues. And some of the issues that were brought up, uh, you know, really don't, really apply to, to the boat. I mean, there are issues of abandoned cars and messy uh, situations in front yards. I don't think this is a messy situation. No. Uh, I, I think that this applicant, uh, in my opinion, has done their due diligence, uh, looked at this very carefully. And uh, I would be in favor of approving this application with the stipulation that it's no bigger than the size boat that he has now. Oh, or maybe just the boat he has now. <laughs> oh, or maybe just the boat he has now. Right. That's fine. Oh, you know, you're going to make him come yeah. back if he's going to buy like the exact same boat, the exact same boat. Oh, yeah, I think we should tell you the truth. Yeah. Well, he's how long? All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess just to kind of move this along before I open it up to the public, I just want to identify for the record that we've received uh, correspondence from Christina Buckley at 27 Crest Street. Uh, who is not opposed to this boat um, that has issues with one of the other neighbors. Uh, William Chase, 
uh, address isn't in this email who is in uh, opposition to it and also points out several other um, situations in the neighborhood that that he asked that she looked at by uh, Mr. Morrison. Um, email from Anna Liss at 36 Crest Street in favor of it. Um, a letter from Cynthia Caligari and Gregory Caligari, 57 Crest Street, um, in opposition saying it's parked there all the time. It's not covered the way it should be. It's not tucked in the back. And a letter from Lydia Cardella. It, 60 Crest Street, um, indicating that they're opposed to it. Appreciation of property values in the neighborhood. Area problem already has issues with people parking vehicles on the grass um, and safety concerns. Now is the one that refers to the projectile. Um, Gene Blake, 69 Crest Street is not in favor. And the last one, I guess, was the correspondence from the applicant that they alluded to with the um, with the map showing the various neighbors and signatures from um, six of the uh, folks in the neighborhood who had no no issue with it. Um, at this point, I would ask if there's anyone in the public that wishes to comment on this application. Um, could you unmute yourself if there is anybody? Hi, folks. My name is Sal D'Agostino. I live directly behind the Tryons, and my father lives directly across on Crest Street. I've got to tell you, um, neither my father nor I or my sister who lives with my father are opposed to any of this. Um, I don't think that it is uh, as detrimental as some of the people who have indicated in their in their letters say it is. Uh, I think it's kept up very well. The property is always kept up impeccably. And uh, I really don't see this as a huge issue. Um, there are some other issues on Crestor. Uh, I'm aware of that. And, um, I'm not sure what the story is there, and I don't want to point fingers at anybody else. But I just got, want to go on record as saying that uh, like I said, I myself live directly behind, behind the Tryons. My father lives directly across. And other other um, neighbors have, have asked me what this is all about. And they said, oh, yeah, we don't have a problem with that. That's not a big deal for us. So just wanted to go on record as saying that um, and thank the commission for looking at this and watching out for our interests. But uh, in, in my opinion, I really don't think this is a, is a big issue. They're a young couple near the neighborhood, which is, I believe, what we want in Wethersfield. And if we can help them out with this, I really think that we should. And thank you for your time. OK, thank you. Is there anyone else in the public who wishes to comment on this application? Ask one more time, anybody in the public wanting to comment on this application? Okay. Um, if not, are there any other questions from members of the commission or any other information that uh, the applicants would like to provide? We're all set here. It's Tony, I, um, I'm reflecting back 10 years ago when we did the 10-year master plan we had a public public hearing over at the community center where a handful of people pretty aggressive on identifying the setbacks in front of homes. And we have, I agree, Peter Gillespie, we have approved some of these, but we've really focused on those fences where the houses are set back maybe beyond the original setback of the subdivision. Um, and with other issues on Crest Street, I don't know what that means, but I think we've seen that over and over again, that there might be other issues in the area. I guess my question to you, Peter Gillespie, is can we put a two-year 
uh, approval on this, maybe to revisit it in two years, or is this something that follows the property? Um, I think you could go either either way. I think you have put time limits on similar, you know, permit applications, and then you review them um, when the two years is up and see if any of the terms and conditions have changed and making sure they comply with uh, the intent uh, of the approval. So that's certainly an option uh, available to you uh, if, if you would like. Okay, I haven't driven the neighborhood, so that's why, you know, I would like to vote on it tonight, but I haven't, uh, I haven't seen the neighborhood in, in quite a while. Okay. I, I support Thank that. You. Yeah, I support that. Do it. Put a time frame on it. Be, be done. All right. Anyone else from the commission have questions, comments? Any closing? No, no, Mr. Chairman, I would just want to say to Tony, why haven't you been back to your old neighborhood? <laughs> Seriously. Well, when I get there, George, I'll take you to lunch. You ready? <laughs> yeah. That's enough. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay. Uh, any any uh, final thoughts from the applicant before we close the hearing? No, thank you. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, would someone like to make a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. moved. Uh, second. All right. We'll say that was made by Peter, seconded by Ryan. Um, Yes, because we have so many people here now, I actually have to pay attention to who's seated and not seated. Um, I'm, I'm not. All of the huh? I was going to say, Rich, I joined late, so I will sit this one out, this application. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, otherwise, all of the regular members are here. So um, since we made the motion to close the hearing, I'll see Peter Lombruni on this one and will not see. David break. Um, so on the motion to close the hearing, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? All right. Hearing is closed. Um, does someone want to make a motion for purposes of starting discussion? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll just follow through with what I said earlier. I, I, make a motion that we approve this application with uh, two stipulations. The first stipulation is that the, the size of the boat, uh, which I believe is 23 feet, if I read the numbers here correctly, yep. Yep. Uh, will be the maximum limit allowed on this uh, property in the front. Uh, and the second, uh, I, I, I think Tony has it right here. I, I think we should put a time limit and I'll just suggest two years. Second, George. All right. So the motion made by Peter, seconded by George, to approve it. Um, as presented, it was May through October, a twenty, a boat not to exceed twenty-three feet, and a time period of um, two years. So I guess Peter, that would mean running through. October of 2023, since this year's over. Yep. Correct. Okay. All right. Is there any discussion? Rich, can I make a comment even though I can't vote? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any other? Um, any other comments, suggestions, questions? Just to verify, this this includes a stipulation that outside of um, the boating season, this is this is not it's not stored in the in the frontage. Yes, it'll it'll be stored in our garage from November to April. Just just yeah. to make it yeah. make it clear, maybe we should add that as a third condition yeah, yeah that's, that's that's i mean we should and i accept it peter if you want to make it okay i i think uh let, let's add that as a third condition that the boat will be stored in the garage uh, from november to april i'd rather go the other way around four. you can only do this 
from May through October. I mean, if they want to put it up in Bolton and Notch, you yeah. know, or something like that. Yeah. This, this is just yeah. where it, when it can be there, not where it has to be other times. Yeah, I, w- I would I would agree with Rich because if they find you know down the road they want to store the boat boat elsewhere. I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter where where the boat is stored. Yeah, fair enough. That that's fine. Okay. All right. So is everyone clear on what it is that that we're voting on? Okay. All right. Um, if there is no additional conversation, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Tom Dean is opposed. Uh, any abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, next item public hearing application 2093-21Z. Uh, Edwin H. May and Deborah W. May, 802 Prospect Street, resubdivision, special permit, and erosion and sediment control plan certification in accordance with section 3.7, 3.9, and 6.6 for the resubdivision of the property into three lots, including a rear lot. And is there someone here on behalf of the applicant? Uh, members of the commission, uh, my name is Kevin Johnson with the engineering firm of Close Jensen and Miller. Um, Peter, if I could share my screen. Yep, let me... Um... Let me do that. I'm going to make you um, co-host here. Okay, you should uh, be able to do that now. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start with the abutters map. Um, Just a quick Uh, site orientation. Um, So this parcel is located uh, at the southeast corner of uh, Prospect Street in Bittersweet. Um, Bittersweet is to the left. Uh, Prospect uh, is to uh, the top. Um, Direction north is also to the top of the sheet. And Thornbush uh, is to the right. Moving to, oh, well, and, and the other thing I'd like to just point out is that this is primarily a residential neighborhood. And as you can see, there's existing residences surrounding this entire parcel. Um, so moving to the existing conditions plan. Um, so this parcel uh, is currently a 4.19 uh, acre site. Um, it's located in the AA resident zone. Uh, there is an existing residence uh, and an accompanying garage, a detached garage structure. Uh, access to this existing residence is from Bittersweet. Um, a portion of this site uh, is, is, is wooded uh, primarily uh, to the west uh, and, and closer to Prospect. Uh, there are you know, individual stately trees and other landscaping. It, it's really a very nicely landscaped lot. Um, The topography generally flow uh, slopes from uh, bittersweet to the east uh, down down towards Thornbush. Uh, And we have existing utility systems in both Bittersweet Hill uh, and Prospect Street. Uh, Utility systems in Bittersweet are uh, subsurface. Moving to the resubdivision plan. Uh, so what the applicant is proposing uh, is to uh, subdivide uh, the 4.19 acres uh, into two additional lots. Uh, there would be a frontage lot uh, off of Prospect um, and there would be a rear lot with access off of uh, Bittersweet Hill. Uh, the frontage lot on Prospect, uh, we refer to that as lot two. Um, it would contain approximately 21,150 plus or minus square feet, about a half an acre. 
uh, whereas 20,000 square feet is required by zoning. Uh, access to this lot would be provided by a driveway uh, from Prospect. Uh, we align this driveway with an existing drive uh, on the north side of Prospect. Uh, and we did provide a turnaround um, two-car garage uh, appropriately sized so cars can back out of either bay and, and exit to Prospect. Uh, in terms of the rear lot, uh, as I mentioned, that has access from uh, Bittersweet Hill. Uh, zoning requires for a rear lot, 50,000 square feet. Uh, we're providing uh, approximately 52,000 uh, or 1.19 uh, acres. Um, the access strip uh, is 30 feet wide. Uh, zoning requires a minimum of 25. So we have an additional five feet of width. Uh, we're proposing a 12 foot wide drive as per article 3.9 regulations for rear lots. Um, we, we did consider uh, in, in uh, design, uh, there is adequate uh, area that we could cut off a lot on uh, Bittersweet Hill. It basically would be another frontage lot. Um, but we, after careful consideration and discussion with the owners, um, we did not feel that would be appropriate for the existing neighborhood. Um, we felt a rear lot set back uh, with existing trees and buffers and so forth uh, would be more appropriate uh, in this setting. Um, we do have zoning tables uh, for the two new lots. Uh, we either, well, I, I believe we, we exceed uh, in all cases zoning requirements for uh, frontage, uh, setbacks, coverage, uh, and so forth. Um, moving on to uh, proposed grading and utilities uh, plan. Uh, as, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the site topography generally slopes uh, from the west to the east, uh, focusing on lot two, the frontage lot on prospect first. Uh, we have a slight cut uh, excavation on the west side of the house, and then we have basically swales around the house um, for, for storm drainage uh, surface flow. Uh, basically, that would flow to the east, and we've located uh, two infiltration basins. Uh, we did do soil testing uh, late last fall. Uh, these basins have been appropriately sized um, for, for water uh, quality and infiltration basins. Uh, we are including a infiltration trench in the bottom of the basin, and we're also providing native plantings, uh, perennials and, and uh, woody ornamental shrubs. Uh, so basically the purpose of these two basins is to mitigate, um, you know, surface runoff to the abutters to the east. Uh, in terms of utilities, uh, there is water, uh, sanitary, uh, gas, electric, and so forth in Prospect Street. Uh, there is an existing sanitary lateral um, that we're going to uh, tie into. Um, we did do a sight line analysis uh, from this driveway um, looking west, or if you're in the driveway looking left, uh, that sight line is about 1,244 feet. Uh, and looking to the right or looking to the east, that's approximately 329 uh, feet. Um, we did do an analysis and have found that for a 40 mile per hour uh, speed zone, which Prospect Street is, that those are appropriate uh, sight lines. Uh, I, I will point out that Prospect is a state street um, at the time of construction or, or prior to construction, uh, these plans would have to go to uh, the Connecticut Department of Transportation for an encroachment permit. Um, obviously, we would have to restore pavement and 
you know, clear any vegetation, et cetera, that condot might require. Uh, but that, that's a step in the future. Um, in terms of the rear lot, um, this lot we call uh, lot three. Uh, again, similar to lot two, uh, we have a slight cut uh, on the west side of the house um, and then surface swales to direct surface storm water uh, around the structure, again, to two infiltration basins, uh, again, with the infiltration trench. Similar plantings, the woody ornamentals, the perennials, um, the access drive uh, from Bittersweet Hill. We have put turning templates uh, on that uh, radius as you enter from Bittersweet Hill. Uh, the zoning regulations for your rear lot require that that uh, turn accommodate an SU-30 vehicle, which is generally the size of a fire vehicle. And once on site, we need to be able to turn that fire apparatus around uh, so that it can exit the site without backing out. Um, the owners obviously did not want to have a sea of asphalt. Uh, we do have this is a three car garage with this house. Uh, this house is, I will point out, slightly bigger uh, than the Prospect Street frontage lot. Um, but again, a three bay garage, uh, there's a turnaround. So any, uh, you know, private vehicles can turn around, drive out of the driveway and the fire truck would pull in, turn to the left into the turnaround, then back up uh, parallel to the garage and then pull out. Uh, the, the slightly shaded area uh, being pointed to right now, uh, that's grass pavers. These are concrete paving blocks. Um, these are uh, precast structures uh, manufactured for these purposes so that, you know, the, in, the, the, the frame of the block is concrete and the centers are infield. Um, you know, with soil and, and can grow grass. So it, it softens the look, so to speak, but it does provide a stable base uh, for uh, vehicle turnarounds. Um, water, uh, domestic water, telephone, electric, uh, that's gonna be brought in uh, from Bittersweet Hill. Uh, we are providing a new fire hydrant uh, at Bittersweet in close proximity to the new site drive. Um, gas uh, service, we're proposing uh, an easement across lot one, or excuse me, lot two, that's the Prospect Street frontage lot, um, and then sanitary sewer from the rear lot. There's an existing MDC sewer uh, to the south, uh, this is basically in the abutting property, the Arboreal property. Um, we actually spent about six months working with MDC uh, on this, extending the easement and so forth. Uh, so the sanitary sewer uh, will be connecting to that MDC system. Um, in terms of erosion and sedimentation controls, uh, Basically, the sites are ringed with silt fencing. Uh, we have individual topsoil stockpiles on each lot. Uh, they're also individually ringed with uh, silt fencing, again, to minimize any migration of soil particles uh, down slope. Uh, we have the stone construction entrance uh, at Bittersweet Hill for the rear lot, as well as the one on Prospect Street for the frontage lot. Uh, we have the full erosion and sedimentation control narrative. Uh, we have notations for seedbed pre preparation, uh, seeding mixture for all disturbed areas, uh, and so forth. Um, so we, we are in receipt of staff comments. Uh, we, we did receive uh, comments late last week. Um, and we just received town engineer comments uh, today. So uh, we were not able to incorporate all these changes um, and get them back to staff uh, for distribution to commission members for this evening. Uh, what I will say is in terms of fire, uh, the fire marshal uh, has no comments. He did endorse the plan and felt that 
um, the turning radii and access for fire apparatus uh, is appropriately uh, designed. Uh, planning uh, comments, uh, they're really, I, I would classify as very minor. Uh, we have no objections to any of those comments. Uh, same with engineering, uh, we have no objections uh, to any of those comments. Uh, the town engineer, uh, I, I don't want to minimize the other comments, but I would say probably the most significant one, and we acknowledge this, is that because of the trenching uh, for water lines in Bittersweet Hill, uh, that the road, which was recently repaved, um, should be milled and overlaid um, and, and restore that and any other you know, damaged conditions back to uh, original condition. Um, and, and we acknowledge uh, that. Um, so this is a special permit uh, because of the rear lot. Um, so as I'm sure you're all familiar, uh, there are um, nine or so criteria uh, that have to be met for special permit. Um, so I'll, I'll just briefly go through these. Um, and how we feel we, we meet these conditions. Um, so article 8.1, uh, suitable location. Uh, again, section 3.9 on rear lots, purpose and intent of rear lots uh, is to allow for development of larger interior lots which have excess lot size. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a 4.1 acre total uh, site parcel. Um, the rear lot is actually going to be larger uh, than the minimum requirements. Uh, again, we could have done a frontage lot on Bittersweet Hill. Um, we did not feel a, a home being located there with a 40 foot setback would be as appropriate as a rear lot, which is set back, um, you know, within a wooded area and, and with a house approximately 300 feet back um, from from uh, Sweet Hill. So we, we feel we have met that requirement of, you know, suitable location, considered alternatives, and we feel, um, you know, it's consistent with the neighborhood. Um, so 8.2, neighborhood compatibility. Um, again, as I mentioned, the house is set back, the proposed house is set back 300 feet or so from uh, Bittersweet Hill. Uh, I mentioned earlier, the setbacks uh, are in excess of that required. Uh, just a quick summary, the frontage for an access strip is 25 feet. We're proposing 45 feet. Uh, the front setback, 60 feet. We're proposing 80. Side setbacks, uh, 15 one side, 30 the other. We're proposing 49 and 101 feet. Uh, rear yard setback. 50 feet and we're proposing 94 feet. Building coverage, we could go to a maximum of 20% and we're at approximately 6.5% with the proposed house. Um, we have had discussions with the owner. We feel this house is probably fairly close to what would be built there. Overall dimensions of the house are about 30 by 60. So that you're looking at a footprint of a house first level of about 1800 square feet. Um, so again, we, we feel, you know, these are not small houses. These are not inexpensive houses. Uh, you know, the, the owner, uh, will be investing significant money in building a quality house, uh, and in building infrastructure. So we, we feel we comply with the neighborhood compatibility. Uh, article 8.3. Uh, appropriate structures and landscaping. Uh, I think I just touched on that. Again, it's an 1800 square foot footprint, plus or minus with a three car garage. Um, we are leaving buffers and setbacks uh, in, in many areas in excess of what's required. Um, I will note, and as I noted originally in my earlier presentation, uh, the site is partially uh, cleared and open grassed. Uh, th this part of the site uh, is more wooded, but there are a lot of trees on this portion of the rear lot, um, which are either diseased or dying. 
Uh, I know an arborist has been consulted in the past on some of these trees. Uh, some of them probably have, uh, you know, a shorter life. Um, but again, we, we are leaving uh, significant strips of vegetation. Uh, and, and as I mentioned on the east side of the house, uh, the downslope side, it, it's about almost 100 feet to the property line uh, to the house. Um, so again, we, we feel we comply with Article 8.3. Uh, 8.4, suitable access and parking. Um, Bittersweet Hill and Prospect are both 30 foot wide roads. Um, lot two, the Prospect Street frontage uh, lot. Again, as I mentioned, um, that driveway is aligned with a, an existing driveway across the street uh, to the north. And we have provided a turnaround. Um, so vehicles will not be backing into Prospect Street. They will be pulling uh, you know, straight out. Uh, as far as the rear lot, uh, lot three, again, that's a three car garage. Uh, I mentioned we providing for the turnaround for the fire truck. Um, the, the passenger vehicles as well uh, will be turning around in the turnaround and pulling out. Uh, the configuration and alignment of the intersection of the uh, access drive with Bittersweet Hill allows for circulation and, and access for an SU-30 vehicle. Uh, and again, that's required by Article 3.98 under the rear lots. And, and again, as I mentioned, um, the fire marshal did endorse uh, this plan and this design. And I, I will mention, um, we, we started looking at this design work almost a year ago now. And late last year, we did have early discussions and, and a virtual meeting with town staff. Um, so we've incorporated a lot of staff's concerns right from uh, the beginning with this overall design. Um, so article 8.5, uh, overall circulation. Again, this is a one family house with a 12 foot wide drive. Uh, there's no changes to the town streets uh, that we're proposing to. Um, Article 8.6, adequate public utilities. I, I think I discussed the utilities that are available and where the proposed utilities are connecting into. Um, we are, I, I did mention on Bittersweet Hill, uh, we are adding a fire hydrant, uh, which will benefit the neighborhood. Um, and we're not uh, connecting any storm drainage from the site to any existing town systems. As I mentioned, uh, you know, we're, we're swaling surface water to infiltration basins and discharging roof leaders to pervious surfaces. Um, uh, 8.7, uh, environmental protection and conservation. Uh, Again, as I mentioned, we're preserving numerous trees and stately trees on lot one, that the remaining lot, 802 Prospect. Uh, we're also preserving buffers to the maximum extent possible, and in some cases beyond the minimums required uh, on the rear lot uh, and, and the frontage lot. Uh, we're creating the infiltration basins, we're adding native plantings, uh, we're incorporating fescue seed mixtures, uh, which require less water than some other grass. Uh, species. Uh, so we believe we comply with environmental protection and conservation. Uh, consistent with purposes. Uh, so basically, um, you know, this is activity that will not have any detrimental effects on public health, safety, welfare, property values, etc. Uh, again, we're not proposing any zone changes. What we're proposing is a single family home houses on both lots. Uh, we're not going to overburden the utility infrastructure. Uh, we're not proposing to change any zoning to a more intensive use. Uh, we are adding the inclusion of the fire hydrant, which demonstrates in our opinion that we're increasing public safety. Uh, so again, um, we don't feel we're impacting the neighborhood or property values or uh, so forth uh, negatively. 
uh, Article 8.9, other considerations. Uh, 8.9A, this has to do signage, uh, lighting. Uh, we're not proposing uh, any signage other than what's required for the rear lots, that there be an identification sign at Theater Suite Hill, uh, which we intend to conform with and have notation on the plan and so forth. Uh, I'm not going to say there's not going to be any post-mounted luminaires or anything down. Uh, you know, there may be one midway. I, I don't know that's to be determined by the owners, uh, you know, in the future, but there'll probably be a, a you know, a residential post-mounted luminaire uh, down close to the garage and, and entry to the house. But beyond that, we're not proposing, uh, you know, Cobra arm, uh, you know, LED lighting and so forth. Uh, uh, 8.9B, uh, adequate landscaping screening for budding uh, uses. Again, I, I've discussed that now, uh, the, the trees that we're preserving. Um, and in all likelihood, uh, the future homeowner is probably going to, you know, introduce more uh, landscaping uh, in, in the future. Uh, 8.9C, uh, the proposed development contains appropriate provision for pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, handicapped persons, uh, you know, provisions have been made for transit service. Uh, you know, the, these primarily con concern residential commercial developments. Uh, we, we have no handicap parking, no transit services proposed. A again, this is residential. Um, 8.9D, uh, this is a double A residence, um, you know, single family house. Uh, it, it's not going to result in uh, incompatibility uh, with neighboring uses, uh, etc., uh, and it's not going to impair uh, the vitality and character of the surrounding homes. Uh, 8.9e, uh, the use will not have a negative impact on neighboring towns or on the region. Uh, again, uh, we're not close to uh, Newington would be the closest town. Uh, we're not even remotely close to the town line. Um, so we feel we do not have any negative impact uh, regarding Article 8.9. Um, I think at that point, that concludes my comments and would be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, George Oracle. Yes, George. Uh, would, would he address the letter to the commission from the neighbor who well, happens to be a town official i believe too does he know what i'm talking about peter i do peter do you want yes. to read that into the record first or how do you want to handle that now how do you want to handle it I, so i it's all i want is handled and i think you should answer some of it maybe or the town staff i don't know how it's well, I think the applicant should respond to it, but if uh, just for the record, um, today at 11.56 a.m., we received uh, an email from uh, Mr. Morris Borier. Um, he is a resident. Um, he lives on the island. He's the first house uh, in the on the island of Bittersweet Hill, so it's immediately across from the rear lot uh, driveway. Um, he lives at 112 Bittersweet Hill. Uh, I won't get into the, the individual uh, items. I'll let, I'll let the applicant representative respond, but it, I believe there were seven specific points that he was making in his uh, correspondence. So I will uh, leave it at that. A, a copy of uh, this letter was forwarded to uh, all of the commission members uh, earlier today and is, um, in the record of uh, our files. Uh, Peter and uh, Mr. Chairman, a question first. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was gonna say, how about, how about we have the members of the commission ask questions, then I was gonna introduce the, the correspondence and 
you know, any other members of the public, at which point I think the applicant can respond to any or all of that just to kind of follow our normal protocol rather than just go out of order for this one email. Uh, yeah, if I could, uh, just as uh, Mr. Johnson went through this and having read that correspondence, uh, I, I, he addressed many of those, for example, like the fire safety is where it was presented in one light in that correspondence. But when you listen to Mr. Johnson with the turnaround, the uh, turning radius off Bitter Street into the rear lot, talking about lot three, um, then when the fire marshal also went on to add how the additional fire hydrant actually benefits the entire neighborhood. So it's actually contrary to a major component of the questions brought up in fire trucks and, and with the turning radius in, inside the box and off a of bittersweet. But I think he addressed all of those through his technical or the majority of those through his technical uh, presentation. I mean, I was satisfied with it at that point but just not to belabor it, but I'll let others go ahead and go from there. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Chair, Thanks. I have a question for the applicant. Sure. Um, you indicated, um, Kevin, in your presentation that you had looked at potentially having a, I guess it was a, a, the third lot being a frontage lot on Bittersweet Hill. And, and I'd like to just follow up on that to understand what what different ways what would you know if there's one that's fine but if there's more than one in what ways could you try to achieve three frontage lots without needing the special permit what would those look like no i i think what i was trying to uh convey was that in in, in lieu of a rear lot we we looked at cutting a frontage lot with frontage on bittersweet hill and instead of a rear lot. So you would have 802 Prospect, the existing home, the frontage lot on Prospect, and only one more lot. It wouldn't be three new lots. It would be a frontage lot on Bittersweet in lieu of the rear lot. But in that consideration, we felt in looking at the character of the neighborhood, the, you know, again, the 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 harmony of the neighborhood and so forth we felt that even though technically we could probably carve a lot out with frontage on bittersweet hill that for that neighborhood it really was not appropriate and we could cite a house there with a 40-foot building line but we felt and the owners felt it would be more appropriate to go the route of a rear lot with an access way and again, preserve as much of 802 prospect and the existing landscaping. So, so, it's not, so it's not that we were looking for a prospect street lot, a rear lot, and another lot on Bittersweet Hill. Yeah, I, when I said three lots, I'm including the existing house lot. So yeah, essentially okay. you, would, you would still get two new lots, but one of them would front on prospect exactly as you have shown here. Correct. And now, and now the difference is on the, but, but I guess just to follow up on that a little bit, you know, could, could that be done where it's set back, you know, more than 40 feet um, and perhaps even set back into the general area, you know, that you have it, that you have it now. I don't know if that might require some modification of the proposed size of the existing house lot or not, but what, what would prevent you from, creating frontage with a driveway from bittersweet and still having that second new house towards the back of the property. Well, again, I, I think it goes back to what the current owners of 802 Prospect want. I mean, again, they, they'd like to, I mean, that even though that was an option, they, they still would like to preserve as much of their existing property, you know, and again, it's a stately property. Um, so that really, you know, even though we could physically do it, um, that that really they felt would be more of a detriment, um, and and they'd rather preserve those those existing landscape features. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess just to, to follow up on what what I think Joe was getting at is that you, you could essentially draw the property line kind of in the southern portion of 802, you know, somewhere halfway between the, the back of the existing house and where you have the access way to the to the rear lot. And you wouldn't even be dealing with special permit. I mean, it would just be you know, basically a conforming lot, but it would be at the expense of a whole lot of trees as well as, you know, the, the um, layout of 802. Yeah, I mean, we, we looked at multiple scenarios, multiple lot lines uh, and so forth. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say there's only one way that you could subdivide this. We just felt for what the owners, current owners of 802 Prospect are looking for, um, you know, I mean, they're going to continue living there, that this was the most appropriate route to go. Mr. Okay. Chairman, can I, uh, yeah, just addressing this point, uh, I live in a lot that uh, my house is 450 feet back and I have full frontage. And the whole front yard is maintained, uh, you know, untouched. All I have is a long driveway. Seems to me that I understand the point that the current owner doesn't want to give up more land. That, that's, that's clear. And that's probably the main reason here this, this is laid out the way it is. But it seems to me very similar to my own lot here in Old Weathersfield. Uh, I don't know what the frontage is on Bittersweet you have what, 40 feet there? I mean, you double or triple that and just go back and you don't have to touch any of the trees. You can still have the, exactly the same configuration you have now. The only difference would be that, that, that the lot line would have to create a frontage that's not special permit. Everything else would be the same. Of course, some of the land that, that the current owner, you know, now wants to keep would have to go to that that third lot, and I'm not sure how what percent of, of that lower corner would have to go to that third lot in order to achieve, uh, you know, frontage required for this for this area. Probably a lot of it to get the buildable square, in. and you'd have to strip out the whole front, and we would be really strip out that whole bittersweet sweet frontage. Is that right, uh, Kevin? Yeah, again, I, I would have to look at, you know, what the total impacts would be, but certainly it would impact, you know, a significant portion of that existing vegetation. And let me ask you this question, Kevin, not to cut you off, but if they made this lot, let's say, they could still site the house where it is today with, if they right. just made a giant lot, correct? Right, exactly. Right, so it's just a giant lot that just blows up the whole neighborhood. Well, I'm not sure that a frontage that's that's consistent with the regulations would would really change much, other than cut out that lower corner there. And uh, Peter, it this is George. It also brings the, that activity of the rear lot wherever it's going to be closer to their swimming pool and privacy in the existing house. No, I understand that's why you know, they want it this way. No, I fully understand the point that the current owner wants to maintain as much of his current property. That, that's why we have this request. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think there are alternatives that are workable if the owner would be willing to give up some, some more land. If I could just comment, um, please, um, for, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we've lived here since 1984, uh, bought the house from my parents who were involved in the Bittersweet Hill subdivision. Um, our goal in the beginning when we started with Close Jensen and Miller was to minimize the impact on Bittersweet Hill. And in fact, we went to the abutting neighbors, including the gentleman who, uh, who wrote the letter 
and we said our plan is to locate a house, set back to have minimal um, intrusion on the Bittersweet Hill circle to the extent it would be the width of a driveway that's required. We'd maintain the, the trees, the landscape, and the house would be set back. And if it's set back 250 or 300 feet, you know, the only site that you will have from your lot, if you're the abutting uh, arboreal lot or the gentleman across the street would be the driveway onto Bittersweet. So um, that was as much in our minds in doing the design work with close Jensen and Miller, uh, you know, rather than to have just a, a, you know, a shocking property built on Bittersweet that would be totally out of character uh, with our neighbors. Yeah, excuse me, could you just, although I think we can all figure out who you are, could you just please identify yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm Edwin May, my wife, Debbie, we, uh, we own the property at 802 Prospect Street and we um, have been working with Kevin Johnson and Close Jensen and Miller for a year. Thank you, I just wanted to- I'm sorry, I apologize. I, I don't wanna be, I don't want to belabor this point. I just want to make sure that people clearly understand what I'm saying. Uh, setting a property line that gives you frontage does not require that house to move forward. You can still have all the trees there that mm -hmm. you have now. You can still set that house way in the back. I mean, that, that's what I have essentially now in my house. Uh, and leave everything in the front the way it is. The only difference is that the lot lines would allow for you know, legal frontage rather than than a flag lot. That's the only difference. Okay. Peter, that would have been easy to do and accommodate the specifications. But in the same regard, a conservation easement could have been put on that that uh, strip, widening all this, making it conforming and making it acceptable with relative ease. Um, but if the owner doesn't need to do that, doesn't want to do that feels that these three car garage homes, I assume these are 3,000 square foot homes accommodate or, or complement the neighborhood and the marketability of the properties. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do it? You know, those are my thoughts. A conservation easement could have definitely satisfied all those issues if you, if you needed to. But yep. I, I think, Kevin, what you're saying is that this is the best for the neighborhood based on what you're analysis of all done on a market value range. We, we felt this was the most appropriate design. Um, you know, let's not lose sight of the fact, I mean, we do have in excess frontage for what's required for an access strip. I mean, per section 3.9 of the zoning regs, you only need 25 feet of frontage for an access strip. We're providing 45 feet. Is there any issue um, with 109's uh, driveway being so close to that, as you say, the street-like driveway for snow removal, do you think? Uh, 109 being the Arboreos? Yeah, it looks like it's they have a driveway section on the survey yeah, I'm mean, looking at right up against the property line. Yeah, I mean, they're probably separated by, you know, 20 feet, 25 feet or so. Okay. It just doesn't hey, uh, this, survey this show, it shows a section going right up to the property line along that driveway. This, this is David Drake. I could ask a quick question. Um, the, bit yeah. of, the Bittersweet Row neighborhood, I mean, I think there would be almost no impact. But what about the guy from Thornbush in the back? How close? I, I'm looking. I'm trying to look for maps. How close you, is are you building to the guy off of Thornbush? I mean, I see them being more impacted than anybody in Bittersweet. Bittersweet, I think well, you, you, you have the aerial no impact, impact at all. Ten, nine, ten. Uh, well, they're pretty back yeah. then. Well, not Ken, really. Didn't I guess, you, yeah, yeah. Ken, didn't you say it was a hundred feet from the lot line? Kevin. I'm sorry. We're, we're about a hundred feet to the lot line. I'll, I'll get you a dimension. Just okay. So it's pretty far back then. Okay. Yeah. Well, so she's two of six that he has up there right now. You can you can see that 
yeah. probably it's closest to the actually closest to the house number 779 on prospect than it, than it is to anybody else right mm -hmm. so to uh number 25 thornbush from the easterly property line is another 180 feet to the house so from the rear lot proposed house we've got about 100 feet to the property line and then there's another 180 feet to that house so there's about 280 feet oh. Oh, so feet. you got a good yeah so that's that's a good i i tell you the truth if you're going to add two lots the way you're doing is probably the nicest way to do it be honest with you i think you know yeah i i think it looks good I, you know, I, again, I, I would just comment, you know, the rear lots, section 3.9 of the zoning yeah. rights, you, you know, the, the regulations state the purpose and intent of this section is to allow for the development of larger interior lots, which have excess lot size. I, I mean, as I said, this is a 4.19 acre parcel, and, and we're creating a rear lot uh, of 1.19 acres in, in excess of of even the minimum required for a rear lot. Um, and, and we're and we're creating more frontage with the access way than required. Hey, hey can, can you go back to drawing five you just showed a minute ago? You, there was a little, uh, was there an existing driveway for Arborios right next to it? Is that what that is? It says yeah, that's, that's what I was pointing out. Yeah. Uh, on, the it, side of, on the side of the garage. Right the there, right there, yeah. There, there's, a, there's a turnaround from the driveway that goes right to the property line but the throat of the driveway is about 25 feet away from the proposed drive okay and i was just worried about the conflict of two people throwing their snow in that small area um, welcome to life in suburbia and and, and our, our our proposed driveway on the arborio side We've got a 10 foot, uh, call it snow strip, swale, green space, then the 12 foot drive, and then nine feet on the other side, or eight feet on the other side. It's a total of 30 feet wide. So I think 10 feet, um, you know, green space from, from the proposed drive to that little turnaround, uh, you know, is more than adequate for, for snow storage. Did the uh, town engineer okay the drainage as proposed, or is that going to come later? And we can't move on this tonight. We we received comments uh, early, late to well, I, I want to say early afternoon from the town engineer. Um, we we ha as I mentioned earlier, we started work on this subdivision almost a year ago. Um, we had a staff meeting, virtual meeting with staff, and I spoke individually with the town engineer last year regarding storm drainage and what our thoughts were. Um, basically, he endorsed what we're proposing. Uh, he had no technical comments with what we're designing. Um, it's, so it's, the only reason I bring it up is because he's so particular these days, our town engineer, on off-lot drainage. And I think you cover it, but I was asking his you if this in his comments to you, did you notice he had any comments or has he said what you propose in this real lot are fine? He he had no specific comments regarding storm drainage. I, I would think if he took objection to it, he would certainly comment. I would think so. Okay, thank you. Um, a, a quick question on a, just a, a, a proposal such as this. Is it a net zero runoff kind of scenario that you would have like, you know, with a, with any other like sort of highway or, you know, other engineering project? Are you, are you allowed to discharge any more, um, you know, pre-post? Uh, again, we're, we're not proposing detention per se. I mean, th these are water quality basins and infiltration basins. So the mm -hmm. goal is to, uh, you know, infiltrate as much into the ground and mm -hmm. the same with the downspouts. Um, okay. I mean, 
in the existing condition, there's a certain amount of runoff that's going to go down slope. Um, right. Again, we've certainly minimized and done what we feel we could. Um, I guess I'm just asking, like, I'm not like asking like a targeted question in any way. I'm just asking, are you, are you required in any way to have like a net zero runoff? Not, uh, not for residential to my, okay. to my understanding. All right. Just making sure. Okay. Um, Peter Gillespie, did we, did we receive the engineer's comments? I didn't see, don't remember seeing them, although we got a lot of emails. Yeah, there were a bunch of uh, neighbor comments and, and, and then correspondence and went back and forth. Uh, it came in late today. I think it went to everybody, but in the uh, uh, chaos that was late later today, I'm, I can't necessarily, uh, there, there are, um, I know Kevin received it. Um, uh, I received it. There are a series of, let me just turn to the right page here. There's a total of 19 comments. Right. Um, I think uh, Kevin had indicated early on, he has reviewed those. He has no uh, objections to any of those being worked into the final, final plans. Um, just to speak to the drainage issue, these plans for both of these lots are conceptual. So I would feel uh, more comfortable that uh, there is a specific uh, drainage uh, condition uh, that would be satisfied at the time a building permit application is submitted at the time a certificate of occupancy is issued for these two lots so that uh, this proposed drainage scheme is maintained as it carries forward into the actual uh, final plans for these individual lots. Uh, there were I did receive some um, phone calls uh, and there's probably a few neighbors who are uh, going to testify in a little bit. They had concerns about drainage uh, impacting their property. So I, I think uh, it just reinforces the need to have a condition uh, on the drainage scheme uh, that could be uh, detailed at the, uh, at the more appropriate time when a building permit is issued. So Peter, these are schematic locations of these buildings and most yes. of it and more detail becoming in the final approvals, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but they don't have to come to us. Correct, it would be a staff level. Oh, okay. Town yeah. engineer, building inspector, zoning officer, mm -hmm. myself. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, yep. can I just address the drainage a little bit here? Peter, you mentioned that there were neighbors maybe that are gonna speak. I've read through this and I can't, remember if it's this or the other one, there's so much information here. Yes. But I seem to recall that at least in, in, in one application, this might've been the one that some neighbors were concerned with water getting into their basement. Is, is yes. this the one? This is the one, yes. Yeah, I think it would be good for the engineer to kind of address that. I, I understand your point that, you know, there's runoff already from this property because it's sloped in a particular way naturally. And I can see that you're trying to mitigate uh, through your grading and your infiltration areas here, you're trying to mitigate any transmission of excess water other than naturally occurs from these properties. Uh, can you address that a little bit more, the benefit of the people that have those concerns? Uh I, I, I'll perhaps at this point turn to uh, my, my engineer, Chris Abidio. Uh, he, he was on site and did the percolation tests and designed the infiltration trenches and sized these. So perhaps he could add a little more information than I could. Okay. Uh, Chris, yep. could you speak to the drainage, please? Uh, sure. What just, we I, did... just identify yourself for the record. Oh. Chris is a video close Jensen and Miller. Uh, what we did was we worked with the town's low intensity development standards. Uh, conversation with uh, Mr. Gregor, the town engineer, indicated uh, that that's what he was looking for, which is to, in a nutshell, um, these drainage uh, structures that we've created on these lots are intended to treat what would be known as one half of the normal water quality volume. Um, 
So that's what we were looking at. And it's a matter of how much of the land is now impervious that was not before and what the normal runoff factors would be, primarily a rational method calculation and how to um, treat that uh, water quality volume as if it were a commercial uh, property like the other gentleman referred to prior with the net runoff uh, of zero. Uh, in a case of residential, we don't have to do a zero. We're looking for uh, a 50% of the water quality volume um, as recommended by other standards. So I'm not sure if I addressed the question you're asking because I haven't seen the comments that were uh, asked, but if you have a comment in particular, yeah. you want to Yeah, I'm just trying to, to clarify for people that have these concerns that joining neighbors, just said simply, I understand the technical terms because I'm an engineer myself, but just said simply, can you state that given the impervious structures and pavement that you've added here, can you state that this plan really does not add any more flow on their property than it would have naturally have occurred without it, this building? Yes, I think it does. Okay, that that that's important because people's concern is that you know there's more flow of water on their properties, and you've you've taken steps to make sure that that doesn't occur. That's what I'm understanding here. Correct. Okay. Good for you, Peter and Chris. That was a good discussion, and uh, I think we have a better understanding, and I hope the neighbors will eventually. So, and by the way, uh, Chris. Yes, George. Thing, you, uh, you have a previous recent relationship with our town engineer. You think he will approve it? Uh, well, we did address the concerns that he brought up in our first and second meetings. Um, this was designed to his specification. So, yes, I think you will. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. Great. Anyone else on the commission have any um other questions for the applicant before we turn it to the to the public? Not, I, I guess, who's that? Um, if not, I'll, I'll just mention that there were two pieces of correspondence, one that we've, well, I guess both that we have alluded to. Uh, one is uh, an email from uh, Leonard and Lucy Skinger, 17 Thornbush Road, um, they're the ones who specifically raised having lived there uh, for 53 years with no water problems. The land slopes downhill from to their uh, area from Bittersweet. And, um, you know, their biggest concern was having, um, you know, increased either amount, volume, or flow of water into their finished basement uh, as a result of the project. And the other one was uh, an email from Morris Boria at 112 Bittersweet Hill, um, which is directly across from the driveway to the proposed rear lot. And he goes through section 3.9 of the zoning regulations and takes issue with a number of the, um, you know, specific criteria being satisfied, you know, including the, uh, odd configuration of the driveway with inadequate e ingress and egress and maneuvering. Um, the, the rear lot would not be in harmony with the development of the area. Um, the rear lot is likely to adversely affect property values in the neighborhood, uh, both um, in the process of the construction uh, by putting the trailer across from his house, as well as digging up the road that has only recently been repaved after years of um, neglect, um, that the creation of the rear lot will diminish the value of the adjoining homes, uh, that the proposed rear lot does not provide for easy accessibility for fire apparatus and police protection, um, that will have detrimental effects on public convenience and property values, and therefore is not consistent with the plan of conservation and development, and that the proposed rear lot does not contain adequate safeguards for the 
uh, environment or adequate landscaping and screening for the abutting users so that, uh, um, in his opinion, it, it does not satisfy the special permit requirements of 3.9. Uh, Mr. Chairman, does he imply in that letter that he understands that the property values will be reduced? And what basis does he make that? And, uh, you know, I, I don't know why he suggests that. It doesn't appear that way to me, uh, the proposal. Uh, I, I don't understand what he's getting at with that one. Anyway, I, it sounds to me like he's getting ready for a lawsuit. But I don't know. I hope he isn't. Yeah. Um, are there any members of the? I guess if we could stop screen sharing so that we can we can see people again at least for the time being, that might be helpful. I'm sorry. Um, oh no yeah, problem. We're gonna do that, Peter. Yeah. Are Are there any members of the public that wish to comment on this application? Um, Sherry Phillips, I see your physical hand being raised. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. I live at uh, Bitter, uh, 93 Bittersweet Hill. And I just want to say after listening this evening, um, I applaud the design that the Mays have come up with. Um, you, unless you've come through this neighborhood, you wouldn't understand that that corner does provide a lot of privacy. I don't agree unfortunately with Morris that um, it will affect our property values. I think in this day and age that housing, those lots being, um, it would increase actually our property values. And my only concern, and I, I know you probably have, I saw Mr. Gillespie and he said, this is usually already taken care of and I've never been on a meeting like this, but the road, as Morris pointed out, is new. And we suffered through a horrible road like a lot of people have had to do for many years. And this is brand new. Is there a provision that would restore the road after construction to its current condition? You would like us to put that in any approval if we make one? Yes, sir, I would. Thank you. Yeah, I was led to believe by earlier conversation that that was in one of uh, might have been one of the town engineers comments that we haven't seen it, it for the record Kevin Johnson it is one of Mr. Uh, Gregor's comments and um, the Mays have agreed uh, that that's a valid point and they will certainly restore the road to its original condition thank you thank you for all of your time tonight okay Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public that wishes to speak on this application? I guess we wore them all out. Anyone else in the public wanting to speak on this application going once? Um, I guess one thing that, that's sort of lingering in, in my mind is, you know, the Quite often we've we've approved applications, you know, subject to the comments of the town engineer. You know, here, you know, we don't we don't know what they are, but <laughs> the applicant has indicated that he's fine with them all. So I'm I'm just kind of musing aloud as to whether we well want to continue this or or I mean, we, what. We are in receipt of the comments. I'm I'm looking at them right now. Again, there's 19 comments. Do you want me to read them or into the record? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I, 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 I don't I know how you want to handle it, it. But, but again, as, as I said, um, you know, there's, there's total of 19 comments. There's nothing really of great technical comments that's going to change any of design a lot of it in my opinion is drafting or how he wants some of the sheets presented uh you know revise a general note identify catch basin tops what type they are 
label houses, label perimeter dimensions of proposed buildings, um, add the following notes to the plans, tree warden notes, uh, anticipated start and completion dates, add uh, horizontal coordinates to existing conditions plan. It, it's, it's really drafting and it, it's nothing technical that, that affects the design or the layout. Um, the most significant one, in my opinion, uh, as I said earlier, not not to, you know, minimize the other comments, but it, it's item number four. Um, Bittersweet Hill was paved in 2019. Therefore, per the town's pavement management policy, add a note stating that a two-inch mill and overlay restoration will be required for the full road width to limits identified by the town uh, if road pavement is impacted prior to 2025. Um, I did discuss that um, with the applicant and they're in agreement with that if, if the commission so deems it to make it a condition or make all, all the, in, that we comply with all the engineer's comments. But really it's, there's no comments in my opinion that affects the design or technical aspects or the drainage. It's again, mostly in my opinion, it's, drafting type things, corrections, notations. Rich, I, yeah, Rich, I, mean, I, I would I, concur I would concur with that summary. There's only one other condition regarding maintenance of the infiltration trenches in the in the stormwater basins um, that is you know is is more than a drafting um, modification. So that's the only other um, real concern is that there be an obligation for the property owners going forward to have a have a note regarding maintenance of the of right. that drainage system. And, and we acknowledge that we're going to add a note to the plan. But okay. uh, as, yeah, Mr. I mean, as Mr. Johnson said though, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Uh, your point that they want the road or the engineer suggested uh, to mill the road. I mean that that's very specific of how he wants that repair. That that's more than than a a graphical comment that's that to me is a requirement and and i think you said that no no i i i said you know the other comments are really drafting type ones but not comment number four i, I right. think i said number four was the most significant one right well I, I would just want to be clear number four is a condition if if the town engineer wants it milled and repaired in that manner that that's a condition that that this commission need, needs to make sure that we capture that's my point. Oh, certainly, and, and we're going to add that notation to the plans. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. I mean, and I guess, I guess all all I was trying to do was find out what those comments were because, um, you know, if, if we're if we're being expected to act on this tonight, I didn't want to have one of our conditions be that, you know, um, the applicant comply with something we don't know what it is. Yeah, totally um, understood. Totally yeah, totally understand. Yeah, okay. Um, Rich and uh, and Peter, uh, this is another issue. Do, and we've never done this that I can ever recall. I've been on that commission a long time. Uh, do we we don't need the tree warden to come out there and evaluate the trees that are proposed to be saved, do we? Or the ones that are going? I don't I don't think that's needed, although it's the beautiful stuff on that site, I gotta admit. No, if they were if they were public trees, um, which they're not, they're private trees, then we would that would be his um, jurisdiction. But uh, no, they're they're private we've trees. We've never required that of any applicant. Ever. No, no. Well, you've been around, and I don't ever recall it being done. Okay. I'd no, like I mean, I, Kevin. I would like them to take a look at that somehow, though, as your engineering staff. I think you've done that, but you can assure us that the trees that are being kept are okay and uh, that kind of thing. That can be. Yeah, we will certainly uh, take that under consideration and, and, and do that. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I, I guess, you know, we seem to be heading toward closing the hearing. I'll, I'll ask one more time you know, whether there's anybody on the commission or any members of the public that have uh, questions for the applicant uh, at this point. All right. Um, if not, 
Kevin, do you have any final wrap up comments you'd like to make? Um, not unless you want me to again, go over the email, um, from the property owner at, uh, 112 bittersweet. Um, again, I, I think I covered a lot of these in my presentation when I went through, uh, the bullet points for special permit. Um, but I, I'd be happy to go through them again. Um, you know, number one from the email, um, you know, the, the first line, the proposed lot truly has no frontage on Bittersweet Hill. I mean, we're creating frontage, um, 45 feet where 25 is required by the regulations. Um, it, it states that it's an odd configuration, inadequate ingress, egress, and space for maneuvering. I, I We disagree. Um, it does accommodate an SU-30 vehicle. Apparently the town engineer and fire marshal agree. Um, the, the fire hydrant, uh, again, we're adding that uh, on the south side of Bittersweet Hill. Um, number two, um, essentially asked whether this rear lot will be in harmony with the orderly development of the area. I, I think we've discussed that quite a bit. Um, I, I think we feel it, it certainly is more so than if we had created a frontage lot. Um, Number three, the construction trailer. There's nothing in our plans, either in notations or graphics that indicates there's gonna be a construction trailer. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, the effect on the road, which was repaved, we just discussed that and are willing to agree to that item number four and Mr. Greger's comments to repave. Um, cramming a rear lot into a very developed and well-maintained neighborhood, uh, again, you know, you look at the, as I've read the requirements of 3.9, um, the intent of, uh, you know, the rear lots is to allow the development of larger interior lots, which have excess lot size, which I, I, I totally think this fits the bill. Um, so I, I'm not really sure what cramming a rear lot means. Um, as for the house property value, um, not sure what basis. I, I'm, I'm not a realtor. I, I'm not an assessor. Uh, my own personal opinion is um, it's probably going to increase property values. Uh, th these are not, you know, small houses that are being proposed. Uh, and, and I believe I mentioned, you know, the owners of 802 Prospect, that they're investing a significant amount of money in new infrastructure and houses. They're, they're certainly not going to construct something out of context or character with that neighborhood. Um, and I think, you know, we've demonstrated that working over the past year, working with staff and, and so forth, that, you know, they, they truly are cognizant of the neighbors, neighbors and neighborhood. Um, so number four, again, talks about diminishing the value of joining houses, safety risk, the lack of frontage, uh, or, adequate ingress and egress. Again, we, we, I, I just spoke about that. I, you know, again, it, it's the, the configuration of that access drive is very conducive to a, a fire apparatus or, or any vehicle entering that driveway. Um, it, it would be worse if, if you had a 90 degree, uh, uh, you know, driveway intersecting Liberty or Bittersweet Hill, excuse me, and, and then turning. So, um, I, I'm not really sure, um, you know, the comments on the ingress and egress. Um, number five does not provide for easy accessibility for fire apparatus and police protection. Again, it kind of piggybacks on number four. Uh, number six, uh, detrimental effects upon the public convenience and property values of the neighborhood. We just talked about that. Um, objectives and policies of the plan of conservation and development, um, section 8.8 .8 of the regulations. I, I believe I went over that earlier. Um, number seven, proposed rear lot does not contain adequate safeguards and assurances that it will protect the environment in the area or have adequate landscaping and screening for the protection of abutting uses. Uh, again, you know, that where the rear lot is proposed, it, you know, I, I think, 
years ago, it was the, the wooded area is probably much more significant. Um, there are a lot of dead trees that have come down or are going to come down. Um, the, the piers, you know, there was probably a microburst and trees came down. Um, so again, as, as I say, we're, we're preserving a lot of the trees around the, the perimeter of the site. Um, and, and there's nothing to preclude, you know, future owner from, you know, adding their own landscaping as well. Um, so, uh, I, I, I'm not really sure on some of these points, what, what the thinking is, but I, I think we've discussed, um, you know, the, the various points required by the special permit. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anything else before we close the hearing? May I just say something? Sure. Is it appropriate time? Yes. Okay. I, I would, I'm, I'm Debbie May, um, one of the applicants. I would just like to say we've lived here since 1983. Um, Ted's parents were here prior to that time. And I think over the time we've been here, we have gone out of our way to maintain this piece of property to its utmost. And maybe some of you have seen me out on our lawnmower, on the tractor, you know, week after week doing mm -hmm. that. But we are um, mindful. We are appreciative of this piece of property. We work very hard to keep it at the highest level possible. We have a tree guy coming in um, within the next couple of weeks to take care of trees, which we can do probably every month. But um, we're appreciative of your, of your consideration, but we worked with Close Jensen and Miller for over a year to try and come up with something that we think really would be the best for this neighborhood. Least intrusive, most attractive, and, and the most positive. So we're kind of blindsided by, um, a few of the comments, but um, anyway, th that I think that's just about it, but thanks for your consideration. Okay, thanks very much. Anything else before we close the hearing? Motion to close. Second. All right, motion by Jim, second by George to close the hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, I guess on this one, um, we'll seat all the regular members. So I would ask Peter and David to sit out. Um, does someone want to make a motion for uh, purposes of starting discussion? I make a motion, Mr. Chairman, to approve this application. I don't know the number of it. Sorry. 2093 21Z. Um, yeah. Is there a second? I'll second, second it. I don't have any Jim, conditions. Anybody it. want any put any on it? I don't think there. I suggest any, but. But I think clearly we would want to include satisfactory compliance with um, the conditions contained in the memorandum from the town engineer dated today um there are 19 of them um and among those is the the milling and repavement of bittersweet hill when it's done uh as well as the comments um in peter's memorandum dated september 16th which specifically includes number 11 um any approvals issued for resubdivision should incorporate a condition that the town engineer must approve individual building permits and plans that incorporate a grading and drainage scheme um, as illustrated in the subdivision plans prior to the issuance of building permit um, and that the improvements must be installed prior to the issuance of a CO. And that specifically was intended to address the, the drainage runoff flow issues that the neighbors had had raised. Um, I don't know whether anyone else has any proposed conditions, but I would 
um, recommend those for for George and Jim to consider adding as part those of the Those conditions are acceptable, Mr. Chairman, for me. Fine with me. Okay. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman, just, just one more. There are a series of agreements, um, terms and conditions that have to be satisfied for the rear lot access per the rear lot regulations. And those would also have to be satisfied prior to the issuance of a uh, of a mylar so that they run with the property. So that's the only other one I would highlight, at least from my my correspondence. How do you word it, uh, Peter? Uh, it's basically well, it's basically spelled out in, in my comment number twelve. So if you want to reference uh, highlight number twelve as it relates okay. to the uh, rear we'll lot that, agreements, we'll make that a condition. Yeah, I mean. Basically, I was incorporating all of them, but I, I mentioned specifically the, yep. you know, the, the building plans one, but uh, required easements and agreements associated with both lots submitted to approved and filed on the land records at the time the approved mylars are filed with the town clerk. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone else have any um, suggested stipulations or comments or concerns? Going once. All right. Um, if not, the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Have a good evening. Congratulations. Oh, thank, thank you, you very all. much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chris, before you start the next application, I have to be excused. Maybe you can pull all this pressure on Mr. Lombroni or Mr. Drake for me, but I have to exit out. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, well, Tony. Take care. To get them to think like you? <laughs> Great. No, I don't think we want that kind of pressure on them. <laughs> uh, next item, application 3. Point, uh, item 3.4, public hearing, application 209421Z, uh, Charles M. Baldwin, lot 181-021, Farmstead and Griswold Road, Resubdivision and erosion and sediment control plan certification in accordance with section 37 and 66 for the creation of two lots. Is there <clears throat> someone here on behalf of the applicant? Uh, Kevin Johnson, close Johnson and Miller. <laughs> <laughs> You're busy of all people. Of all people. Um, Peter, if I could share a screen again. I think you still have permission still to do that. It. Okay. Yeah, give it a shot. All right. Okay. So again, um, just a quick orientation uh, with the site. So this is a parcel uh, known as assessors number 181-021. Uh, uh, it's a parcel that has frontage on both uh, Farmstead Road uh, and, and Griswold, Farmstead being to the left, uh, Griswold to the right, uh, direction north is to the top of the sheet. Uh, again, you can see it's a residential zone, um, pretty much surrounded by uh, existing one family uh, residences. Uh, moving to the existing conditions plan, uh, this is a parcel that contains approximately uh, 31,690 square feet or 0.7 plus or minus acres. Uh, it's located in the A1 residence zone. Um, it's, it's a lot that's predominantly uh, clear of vegetation, grasses and so forth, uh, you know, predominate the, the center of it. Um, the farmstead end of the lot, there's there's trees on the periphery uh, on both sides, the north and the south. And, and then on the Griswold uh, street end, there's some frontage trees and, and there's uh, two street trees uh, in the town right of way. Uh, generally the topography slopes uh, again from west to east or left to right. Uh, there's about a 20 foot grade change 
uh, across the parcel. Uh, there's existing uh, utility systems in both Farmstead Road uh, and Griswold Road. Um, moving to the resubdivision plan. Uh, so again, uh, the proposal is to subdivide this parcel into two lots, uh, one frontage lot, uh, on Griswold and one frontage lot on Farmstead. Um, the Farmstead lot uh, would have an acreage of approximately 17,499 square feet or 0.4 acres. The Griswold Street lot uh, would have approximately 14,191 square feet or 0.33 acres. Um, 13,500, I believe, uh, is the minimum requirement. So we exceed both uh, in square footage. Uh, in terms of side yard setbacks, uh, rear yard, front yard, coverages, and so forth, uh, we meet or exceed all the zoning uh, requirements. And there is a zoning table included on the plan which documents all that. Uh, moving to the grading uh, utilities plan. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, um, the property slopes from, from west to east or left to right. Uh, so we've located, again, these are schematic homes. They approximate, you know, say a, two, uh, a colonial style house with a two car garage. Uh, the houses we indicate are about 36, I believe, by uh, 28 or so. Um, so on the farmstead lot, uh, again, in terms of grading, uh, we've created a high point uh, in the front yard and then created drainage swales uh, around both sides of the house, uh, converging again in an infiltration basin, uh, again, uh, planted uh, with native species uh individual topsoil pile uh between the house in, in that basin uh the griswold street lot similar condition uh basically doing some cutting to the rear of the the home uh creating a high point again swales around both sides of the house uh, again infiltration basins uh in the front yards again planted with native plants and grasses uh the Grizzled Street lot, uh, because of the, the grade change, um, the garage would be one level down, uh, retaining wall built on the south side of the driveway and, and sidewalk and steps up to uh, the house. Uh, this is a condition that exists, similar grading treatment as a couple of the houses to the south. I think the, the, the abutting property to the south is maybe you know, half a level, maybe a split type level house. Uh, I, I believe the second one to the south has similar grading uh, and, and differential as this. Um, so in terms of uh, site utilities, uh, the farmstead lot would connect to public water and sewer. Uh, in Farmstead, uh, there is an existing utility pole uh, on the far side of Farmstead, so we'd be getting electric and telecom and so forth overhead uh, for that home. Um, on the Farmstead lot, as I mentioned, there are existing trees on the periphery in the rear corner. Uh, we went to great lengths to grade this lot to preserve all those existing trees so they will all remain. Uh, on the Griswold lot, again, there's, and I apologize, the trees, they're a little faint on this plan. Um, there's a couple in the rear yard. Uh, there's one in the northeast corner of the lot. Uh, there's a couple uh, in range with the rear of the house on the south lot line uh, that we're preserving. The ones that are required to be removed are predominantly along the street frontage uh, of Griswold. Uh, to accommodate the grades and driveway. Um, there is one street tree uh, that's impacted um, that by, by utilities and driveway that we're going to uh, 
remove and we're proposing to replace uh, with a new street tree, deciduous tree. Um, one thing I will mention is both of the trees in the town right of way along Griswold, uh, in my opinion, I'm, as you all know, I'm a landscape architect, not an engineer, but in my opinion, both of those trees are in poor health. The northerly one that we're proposing to remove, um, it looks like at some point in the past, uh, you know, portion of the tree split, came down, in my opinion, not in very well health, good health. Uh, the other tree, it, we're proposing to retain that. Um, again, that's probably a tree the tree warden wants to look at. Uh, it's got significant crown dieback. Um, again, in my opinion, it's probably short on life and it's not going to last that long, but that's a determination for the tree warden to make at some point in the future. But again, at this point, we're proposing to retain that existing tree. Um, so again, uh, utilities uh, for the Griswold lot, um, water, sewer, uh, electric, all that will be uh, obtained from Griswold uh, Road. Uh, we did do a sightline study uh, on Griswold. Um, so uh, standing in the site driveway, looking north or looking left out of the driveway, uh, we have a sight line distance of approximately 1,415 feet. Uh, looking right or south out of the driveway, uh, we have a sight line distance of about 349 feet. Uh, again, it's a 35 mile an hour speed zone. Our, our calculations and determination indicate that those sight lines are adequate for a 35 mile an hour speed zone. Uh, we are asking for erosion and sedimentation certification. Uh, again, the heavy black dotted lines, uh, they represent silt fencing around the perimeter of the site, as well as around the individual stockpiles. Uh, on the Griswold lot, we have silt fencing along the property line, uh, except for a break where the driveway is. And again, because there's grading work, uh, regrading the sidewalk. We have an additional row of silt fencing within the town right of way. Uh, we've got the construction stone construction entrances for both lots, uh, the erosion narrative uh, indicating the installation and maintenance of the erosion controls, uh, seed bed preparation, seed mixtures, uh, and so forth. Um, so again, we are in receipt of staff comments, um, the fire marshal uh, endorsed the plan, had no comments, uh, adequate for fire access. Um, planning, uh, there was a handful of comments. Uh, one comment that I would like to discuss with the commission, uh, which we disagree with, is planning asked to have an iron pin set uh, and that's where the cursor is on the screen right now. This is at a property line between two abutting lots. Now, this is an existing condition which has existed since these houses were built. Um, it has no bearing on the two lots that we're creating. Um, I did discuss this with Mr. Gillespie, explained to him that for us to set an iron pin at that property corner, we would have to do additional field survey on the two abutting lots, uh, we did not feel it was a fair request to pin a lot for two abutting lots, um, you know, that that would be extra expense and so forth on our client. So I, I would ask the commission for relief on that one comment um, made by planning. Uh, again, engineering, we're in receipt of town engineer comments. Again, there was nothing uh, substantial that we took exception to, and, and we will work with staff to incorporate all their comments uh, on revised plans. Again, we did not receive comments, uh, you know, until late uh, last week and, and just did not have time to respond with new plans for, for distribution to uh, the commission for this evening. But again, I'll, I'll reiterate, reiterate we're, we're fully going to address these comments and, and work with staff, but we, we take no exception other than that one iron pin that I discussed. 
And with that, I Kevin, will. Um, just, just so that I'm clear, because the cursor movement was kind of not coinciding with your narrative. Okay. The iron pin location that you disagree with is the one in the middle of the south right, boundary. Right, right, where the, right where the cursor is now. Um, <laughs> why why are you requiring it? I mean, why are you putting it in? I mean, wouldn't the other property owner have put that in? Well, again, as, as I said, we're, we're creating a new lot line between the farmstead lot and the Griswold lot, and we're going to pin that new corner that intersects that southerly line. But what planning... Yeah, but this, has, is, this is a few feet to the east. east that, that's correct. And, and that's what I am asking the commission for relief from that comment. Uh, as I said, that's an existing lot line. I mean, we, we show a line there just to indicate that there's two different properties. But for us to put an iron pin on that southerly property line a few feet away from the new lot line, we would have to do additional field survey on those two abutting properties. And we did not feel it was a fair request for our client to go to additional expense for survey work and to install an iron pin on two neighboring lots, a, a common point between two neighboring lots. So, so that's I would agree, and that that was done only a few years ago. That that adjoining property and the pin should have been put in then. I agree. And why can't Peter? Why can't you go back to the previous property owner and tell him to put a pin in the corner of his lot? That was a corner. Yeah, that, that's not the nature of what we do going backwards. If, if it should have been done at no. a point in time, it should have been done at a point in time. I have no objection to you guys. Uh, after Kevin explained to me uh, the complication required to locate that pin, I, I have no objection to that. Oh, okay. All right. Peter, I'm curious, what, what was your thinking in asking for that? It's so close to the new property line that it's likely the neighbor will probably think that that other pin that they place for the rear lot line is his property line and it's only a few feet off. So I'm just, it was, uh, the intent was to avoid any future confusion amongst the property owners as to where exactly that rear property line was. Okay. Actually it may make more confusion because people will flip them when they want to. <laughs> <laughs> the western guy will think you have a bigger lot and the eastern guy will right. think he has a bigger lot. <laughs> That's why they put up fences. They better not. Well, they, they, they better do a survey. That's what they better do if that becomes a problem. Yeah. All right. Um, Kevin, was that was that your entire presentation or is there more? No, I think that concludes my comments at this point. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, Kevin, how about the fire station? The turns of the fire station are not a problem for this site? The, the turns? Well, any turns there. They're, they're pretty close there, aren't they? Uh, they're, they're, a away, farther, they're a little farther south. I, I don't think there's going okay. to be a conflict with driveways. Sorry, I didn't go on. It's all right then. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, the three. Do you really think that tree should be removed by you guys uh, if you think it's bad? That the, tree tree? The, the one that we're calling to remain? Yeah. Um, well, again, in, in my opinion, it's got crown dieback. Uh, I'm not saying it's dead right now, but, you know, it, it's not in a healthy condition. Um, but, we, we, we didn't want to propose taking more down than we had to. Um, of course, you save, you save the applicant money. But the point is that uh, I think it ought to go myself if it's bad. I'm not saying you got to replace it either, but at okay. least take it down. Okay. The, the other thing I will add, um, I, I believe both species are Norway maples, which 
you know, at one time they were a great street tree, but now they're considered invasive. So, hey, Kevin, I had two of them in my yard. They got <laughs> big, and they had they came down eventually. And guess what was in the center of them? They were rotten. Yeah. And they were Norwegian maples, both of them. Yeah. So I don't trust those trees. <laughs> All right. Does Kevin, anyone else did, have any questions? I just Kevin? have a clarification, Kevin. Can can you show me again which tree you're replacing there in the front? Uh, it, it's it, it, right there where the cursor is. There's an existing one. There's an arrowhead that points to the center, a, a dot, and, and then the proposed tree is the heavy dark one just to the side. And the reason we're removing that northerly tree. Uh, is to accommodate grading for this drive and lowering of the sidewalk. Okay, I got it. Now That's... you'll replace it, right? With We're replacing one? that with, with a new maple, but a different maple. Okay, good. We okay. do maple. Just for the record, that will require the um, action of the Shade Tree Commission. So there will need to be a, a process uh, to, to get that uh, posted. Uh, for the tree warden to inspect it and for him to, uh, the commission to actually act on that. So uh, he may at the same time take a look at that other tree uh, and make some decisions on that as well. Okay. These, uh, okay. these roads are all town roads, right? So Griswold is a town road as well as Farm yeah. yes. Yates, right? Correct. Yes, correct. Yep. So any repairs that are done for connection to the utilities? are going to be per town requirements, I assume. And per MDC requirements, yes. Correct. And I believe we have details and notes to that effect. OK. OK. Anyone else have questions for Kevin? If not, are there any members of the public that wish to come in on this application? Yes, I have uh, a comment. Uh, my name is okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask, could you let us know your name and address for the record, please? Yeah, my name is Chris Coe. I'm at 151 Griswold Road. And I'll uh, quote Shakespeare, brevity is the soul of wit. It's getting late and I won't keep you here long. I know that um, I'd like to just cut and paste some of the discussion from the maze into this discussion as to uh, drainage. We heard Mr. Johnson talk about the 20 degree uh, uh, change in grade from Farmstead to uh, Griswold. My house uh, was built in 1874 and I'm right to the north of the uh, proposed lot too. And I, I just like to remind everybody that, you know, my house was built in 1874 and uh, from what I understand, these two lots were one time connected to uh, my lot and my house uh, is very sensitive uh, as a lot of historic homes are in uh, Weathersfield to any sort of moisture change. And I think, you know, the last couple of years we're seeing for whatever reason, a change in climate and a change, things seem to be getting wetter. So you know, I, uh, I just for the record, I, I just want to say that I don't have any objection to what the Baldwins are doing. Uh, some of the family still lives next door to me, and I know uh, Charlie Baldwin. I've met him. Very nice people. I hope they get a lot of money for their lots, and uh, and somebody builds nice homes next to mine. It's just I'd like the town to just keep in mind that whenever the developer decides to build these lots, that you know, uh, we just take into mind my poor 1874 foundation. I just don't want to have a, you know, an indoor swimming pool in my basement. So I just want, you know, that on the record. And I, I just have, uh, will leave my trust in the uh, town of Weathersfield and uh, Mr. Johnson to make sure that that doesn't happen. No, thank you very much. And, and I guess in the spirit of cutting and pasting the uh, the the same stipulation that was put on the uh, May approval regarding um, town engineer approving any individual building permits and plans, including uh, grading and drainage schemes, uh, to make sure that there are no adverse offsite impacts 
uh, on your property as well as some specific recommendations from the town engineer and his memo dated the 17th um, you know designed to or intended to make sure that the uh, infiltration basins and and the on-site drainage proposals uh, work as intended um, are also things that um, I would anticipate that we will include as stipulations in our approval this evening. Perfect. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public that wishes to comment on this application? If not, um, could we stop? I guess last call for any commission questions for Kevin. If not, is there a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close. Okay, second. second. Uh, motion by Jim. Second by Tom. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Extensions. Okay, the hearing's closed. Tony has left, so that leaves us needing one alternate. I asked Dave to sit out the first time, so this time I'll ask Peter to sit out and I will seat David Drake. Um, does someone want to make a motion on this application uh, to start discussion? Motion to, motion to pass. I don't have the number in front of me and uh, whatever conditions you want to put on. <laughs> A blank check motion from Jim. You Buehler. got it. Just to get it rolling, boys. That was fantastic. Right. That's the best. I didn't realize it was that easy. I don't have a headset. I, would, I don't I have a move. fancy chair or a mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Somebody's Chairman? jealous. Tom? Yes, uh, Tom. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes. I would... Uh, uh, move to uh, uh, amend that uh, that motion to uh, include the conditions that are uh, in, that are mentioned in uh, the the memorandum from the town planner um, and uh, any other uh, conditions uh, that may have been in, uh, provided by uh, the town engineer. Uh, relative to this application, except for the deletion of uh, that particular uh, uh, you know, proposed uh, qualification or condition that the town planner included in his memorandum regarding that uh, particular iron pin, uh, to deduct that iron pin from uh, the, uh, the conditions, but include the, the other uh, part of the conditions. Okay, so Jim made the motion. I'll, I'll take your comments as a second with conditions uh, that we include everything in, in Peter's memo other than item three under site plan comments as well as um, the, the comments in Derek's memo of September 17th. And all good. All, it's all good with Jim. Is there any further discussion? Any comments, questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? All right. Motion carries. Thank you. Hey, thank you all. Have a good evening. Okay. Take care. Uh, next item, number four, other business. I see nothing five minutes there's nothing six um staff reports peter do you have any just just a just a couple of minor things the uh this year's uh salute to business which is done by the edic has been moved up early we're doing it on october 20th and it's going to be uh on the deck uh the outside deck of the river restaurant at 100 great meadow so if you want to put that on your uh, calendar, uh, save the date, uh, please do that. And then secondly, uh, we are doing the uh, final 
inspection certificate of occupancy uh, for the Chase Bank project uh, tomorrow. So uh, that is nearing completion uh, as, as we speak. So um, take a look at that project. I think it turned out, turned out very well. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Peter? All right. Um, next item is public comments on general matters of planning and zoning. The none uh, correspondence, the quarterly newsletter from the uh, Aqua Turk ZD Society uh, was included in our, our packets. And uh, we have a lengthy list of upcoming pending applications to be heard at future meetings that have generated a great deal of um, chatter on Facebook and elsewhere. Yes. Um, not the least of which is why isn't Trader Joe's on here in, for the 280th consecutive month? But uh, <laughs> uh, so three out of those three out of those five will be on the next agenda, and then the other two will be on the uh, October 19th. So we're spreading them out a little bit. Okay, good. No, and it's it's encouraging to see activity. Um, all right. Does anyone else have anything else? Um, anyone have anything else that the, they want to discuss um, before we call it a night? If not, someone want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. Second. All right. Motion by Tom, second by Ryan. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate everyone's endurance and patience. <laughs> See you guys. Okay, everyone. Have a good, good evening. Good night. Take care. Good night. Good meeting. <laughs>